begin transmission. The crew is sick. We have been sick for several days and we just keep getting sicker. Uh, this the sickness is not, as far as we can tell, bacterial. It's not viral. In fact, it seems to be largely confined to our digestive systems. But eight out of ten of us have had abdominal pain, cramping, uh, fevers. Some some have had pneumonia-like symptoms. Um, others are um, experiencing constipation and diarrhea at the same time. I think three examples will be sufficient to communicate the extent of our current suffering. Um, first of all, Dr. Arnold, our botanist, um, has had his hand grow about twice the size that it normally is. And his hand seems to be swelling when, with lymphatic fluid. And so when we looked at it under a scan, what we saw was that inside his lymph nodes, all throughout the lymphatic vessels, there are little tiny worms that are plugging up all his um, lymph nodes. This causes an edema, a swelling of the lower extremities, and is quite painful, as, as prevented him from being able to grip his tools or write, and it's all due to these little tiny worm-like creatures. Um, uh, secondly, uh, many of, the, of, of us have been complaining about a, uh, a shadow moving across our vision. Every once in a while when we're, we're sitting still, we just uh, feel a, a sharp pain, and then we see a shadow flit across our, our eye. Well, uh, during one of these episodes, we were able to shine a light into the eye to see what was actually going on, if anything was actually present there, or if this was a, a mental problem. What we saw was this. Inside the eye, a worm-like creature crawling about. This was quite disturbing to us. We feel as if our body should be our bodies alone, and we shouldn't be invaded by... Um, foreign entities, especially not in our in our eyeballs. Three of us have had these symptoms so far, so at least 30% of us have been infected with these uh, types of worms. And they're not anelids, they're not segmented worms, so they belong to a completely different uh, phylum, and that's what we'll be talking about today. The next video is um, a very gruesome, a little very disturbing, so viewer discretion is advised. One of our, our crew members <clears throat> had a, uh, a bulge in his uh, lower ab abdomen and extensive pain, uh, terrible, uh, terrible discomfort. And when we uh, palpated the abdomen, it seemed to writhe beneath the medic's fingers. And so we took him in for surgery. And what follows is inside his intestine, we discovered uh, these worms a horrifying number of creatures inside this poor man's intestines. So we stitched him back up and I think he'll be just fine, but the accumulation of these parasites is extraordinary and terrifying. Now hindsight is 2020. Uh, would it have been wise for us to use uh, pr protective equipment when we were colonizing this planet? Yes. Would it have been um, wise for us to filter our drinking water and maybe separate our waste from the drinking water? Yes, those seem like good ideas now, but two things you have to remember. Um, first of all, we kind of operate just by trial and error, right? Uh, we, uh, this is the 19th mission. There are 18 missions b b uh, behind us, um, so we don't, we don't really know what we're doing. We're just going out here and seeing if something works, and if it doesn't work, we, we try better next time. So now we know, now we know um, that when we go to a new planet that's potentially full of life, potentially full of hostile forces, potentially full of parasitic uh, creatures, we should probably wear protective equipment, maybe even a full, full suit with a helmet, um, gloves, um, and we know that uh, a lot of eggs are passed in human feces, and if we drink those, then we can reinfect ourselves. Now we know that, and that's that's good information. I don't see how we could possibly have known that uh, before this. It's just something you have to experience. Um, and uh, otherwise, I mean, there's just really no way to prevent infection like this, realistically. Uh, secondly, um, another major point is that this is uh, science fiction, and in science fiction, you kind of have to, there's a certain level of, um, general incompetence that must be assumed in order to move the plot, plot forward. So the, for those two reasons, that's that's why we're all terribly infected with, with parasites. Now, remember Dave? <clears throat> Dave was telling us about these, uh, these creatures that have piercing 
faces, spears on their heads, and they slurp up your blood, swell up to a balloon size, and then take your blood away. Well, it turns out Dave was actually not making that up, even though it sounds extraordinary. Uh, many of us have experienced this, and they're uh, buzzing around all over the place. They're little tiny creatures that make a high-pitched uh, whirring buzz sound with their wings, and they apparently love our blood. So we've taken to calling them uh, little flies because they are small and they can fly. <clears throat> so little flies, uh, Latin fly is uh, musca, and uh, uh, fly will we'll tap on the... Uh, the Spanish for small in there, so we're calling these these little flying creatures uh, mosquitoes. So uh, mosquito, uh, these uh, mosquitoes are um, apparently not only taking blood from us, they are giving us something in return. And that something in return is not a pleasant gift, it is actually little worm-like parasites. So many of these parasites we're getting from the flies around us, and not just the mosquitoes, there are other species of flies, um, and some of them are vectors for these parasitic diseases. So uh, for th in this case, Dave was absolutely right. We should have been concerned about these, these flying spearheaded monsters that, care that not only take our blood, but give us parasites. And in the future, like I said, in the future we'll know to be protective about this, but just kind of something you have to experience for yourself. Master Sergeant Jimbo Rush told me, and I can't verify this, and I'm pretty skeptical, but uh, Rush told me that if you flex as hard as you can, once the mosquito's proboscis is in your muscle tissue, the muscles will contract around the proboscis, preventing the mosquito from flying out. And because it's in the act of slurping up your blood, it'll just keep slurping, 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 and swelling, 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 until it eventually explodes. Uh, Master Sergeant Rush told me he's done this, he's done this himself, and he's seen the mosquitoes explode on his arm. Highly unlikely, because this is probably capillary action. Um, I think uh, Rush is just looking for any excuse to show off his uh, monstrous muscles. But uh, at any rate, it is, it's a curious creature, and it's a creature that we should prevent. I don't think it's a good idea to stick your arm out waiting for them to land so you can demonstrate how you can um, explode mosquitoes with your gigantic muscles. Um, Master Sergeant Rush. Today we'll be discussing the biology, behavior, anatomy, and physiology of these nematode worms, or roundworms as we've taken to calling them. They don't have the nice distinct segments um, or the paired epidermal seti that distinguish the anelids. Rather, they are encased in a hard cuticle made of collagen. And this is, this is a pretty unique structure. They're still limbless, so there, there are lots of crawling, creeping, uh, flying things on this planet but there are lots that are worm-like. So we have segmented worms, and now we have round worms in phylum nematoda, and the nematodes are what we'll talk about today. Nematodes are fascinating creatures, and given the somewhat horrific and disturbing nature of their discovery, many of the crew members want me to just burn everything with fire and they completely ignore that we discover these creatures. However, these, these are really fascinating animals. They have complex life cycles, um, the way they adapt themselves to different environments and evade our immune systems is, is quite remarkable. And we need to know how they do so, so that we can prevent infections in the future. So Nematoda is a phylum quite distinct from the Anelids. Anelids, as you will remember, have internal body segments divided by septa and are distinctly metameric, and they have paired epidermal seti. Um, also, a lot of the, the Anelids will have tentacles, on their head or kind of pro, some kind of prostomial palps of some kind. Nematodes don't have any appendages, they don't have any seti, they don't have any bristles, they don't have any um, uh, obvious tentacles or any kind of palps of any kind. They're kind of smooth and part of the reason for that is because they're coated in a thick hard cuticle called a cuticle and when um, this, this cuticle restricts their growth, and so periodically they have to shed that cuticle. This characteristic, having a hardened um, cuticle and periodically shedding it, makes them members of clade Ectisoa. Ectisoa includes some of the most interesting animals here, uh, like those little myrmidons I was talk telling you about. They're uh, insects within phylum Arthropoda. But also there are some velvet worms and water bears, there are some horsehair worms, and the group we'll talk about today are the nematodes. This entire group, incredibly diverse group, with many, many thousands of species, 
are all united by the characteristic, the synapomorphy of ecdysis. Ecdysis is a process of shedding this um, hard cuticle. And as you can see, um, the main difference between the nematoidea and the panarthropoda is the presence or lack of ventrolateral appendages. So uh, the nematodes, a very diverse group, um, united by ecdysone and ecdys um, ecdysis. Ecdysis is the process of shedding the, the, the cuticle, and this is a process controlled by the hormone ecdysone. So hormone ecdysone controls the process of ecdysis. Make sense? Nematodes are pr uh, primarily small worms, less than a centimeter long, uh, although some of the larger parasitic nematodes can get over a meter in length. Uh, many of them are parasitic and they are numerous. They're some of the most numerous organisms on the planet and for most of us if they weren't parasitic they would pass on by completely unnoticed. Um, so we pay extra attention to the parasitic ones but the vast majority of nematodes are not parasitic. Um, we have not nearly tapped the diversity of nematodes on this planet there are probably over half a million species at least, and they inhabit the water, uh, the land, they live on plants and um, on animals, they're free living. Some are parasitic, some are commensals, uh, but it's a pretty, re a very extremely remarkable, extremely diverse group. In fact, I would imagine that they're so diverse, so numerous, that if you were to remove all of the, the plant life from a forest and all the animal life from a forest, you would still see a shimmery sheen of nematodes uh, where those trees used to be. You can make out the outlines, you can make out the species based on the species that inhabit those particular plants or animals. Um, and if we were here long enough and we became part of this planet, I imagine that if we were to remove a human from a chair where they were sitting, there would be a little clump of visible shimmery shiny nematodes left where they used to be sitting. Now, you know, those little companions of yours, those little parasites that uh, follow you, go with you wherever you wherever you are. So nematodes are incredibly numerous, incredibly common, and incredibly abundant. Externally is, uh, their external morphology is fairly simple. They're going to have a mouth on the anterior end and an anus on the posterior end and their entire external morphology is covered in, as I've said before, this hardened cuticle. The cuticle is secreted by a hypodermis, which is what their epidermal uh, tissue layer is called. So the hypodermis secretes the cuticle. And the cuticle is made from collagen, which is a, a flexible, st sturdy protein that is found in human connective tissue as well. And as I said before, the cuticle restricts growth, so it must be periodically um, shed. Unusually for most creatures, um, nematodes have actually three excretory openings. They have an excretory pore near the anterior end for um, metabolic wastes and ion regulation. They have a genital pore for reproductive output, and then they have an anus for digestive excrement. So this, in most organisms, all three of these systems usually funnel into the same one or maybe two. Um, so it's highly unusual to have three openings in the same organism for the three different systems. So that's a, a distinctive characteristic of nematodes. Internally, nematodes are pseudosolomic creatures, meaning that they don't have a true coelom. And we can tell this because they have a endoderm that lines their intestine, and they have a mesoderm from which all their muscles are derived, and they have an ectoderm, which is their, um, their hy uh, hypodermis. Uh, but their mesodermal tissue does not completely surround their endoderm, um, and so they have a body cavity, but it's not, it's not completely surrounded with mesoderm, so it is a pseudocelum, it's not a true coelom. There are some very strange characteristics of this. On the ventral and um, dorsal side, there is a hypodermal cord that runs, and in here is uh, contained the ventral and dorsal nerve cords. Nerve cords in most creatures extend synapses out from the nerve cord to the muscles, but in nematodes, the muscles send out protoplasmic processes, these 
dendritic-like things to the nerves. So it's opposite. Most creatures, nerves send out dendrites to muscles. In nematodes, the muscles send out dendrites to the nerves. And you can see that there are no circular muscles. There, all these muscles are longitudinal. And so how the organism moves is it has to flex its cuticle. And whenever it, it flexes its cuticle, it's going to put potential energy into the opposite wall of the cuticle because the cuticle is going to stretch like an elastic band and it's going to want to snap back into place. So what you get over time, you have an antagonistic set of muscles working against the cuticle. So we've talked about, uh, you guys are familiar with clams on Earth. Clams open and shut with adductor muscles and hinge ligaments. It's the same similar structure here where you have um, a connective tissue that stretches when the muscle contracts and then when the muscle relaxes, the connective tissue can snap back into its original uh, position. So that's how nematodes move the, by antagon antagonistically flexing muscles and the cuticle back and forth. Most of a nematode's physiology is constrained by its internal pseudosalomic pressure. So inside the nematode, you have very high hydrostatic pressure, and this gives it a hydrostatic skeleton, and this presses up against the very strong cuticle. And so because you have a very firm cuticle, you can have much higher increased hydrostatic pressure inside than a jellyfish can or a worm could, um, simply because the cuticle is so strong. So in the internal pressure of a nematode is actually remarkably powerful, and most of its uh, physiological processes are adapted to this high internal pressure. For example, its digestive system, it doesn't actually have uh, muscles in its intestinal wall, as most creatures do to move food along. Instead, how it um, digests is, uh, well, first of all, how it eats is it has to force its mouth open around the food. So it, um, it, has, it has special muscles that will force the mouth open with enough force that the food is just uh, sucked into a negative vacuum into the pharynx. So they don't actually eat directionally. They, they find prey and then move their, open their jaws with enough speed that it creates a negative vacuum and it sucks food in quite rapidly. To get food from the pharynx into the intestine and then down through the intestine out the anus, um, they don't have any muscles for peristalsis. So what they have to rely on is just more food in the mouth. And the more food you have in your mouth, in your pharynx, it just pushes like a little train car down to the end. When you get to the end of the worm, or the posterior end at the anus, the, the food will be, or the waste products will be excreted. Um, you have to actually physically pull open the anus because it's so tightly closed because due to the high internal pressure of the nematode any break in the cuticle leads to an explosive release of internal organs so to release the food you just physically prop open the anus and food is automatically expelled through the force of the hydrostatic skeleton which is pretty remarkable so no peristalsis or muscles in the intestine. You have to physically force the mouth open to create a negative vacuum, and you physically force the anus open, and waste is expelled through um, high pressure. Nematodes um, are fascinating in that they are both anaerobic and aerobic organisms. The aerobic forms utilize a Krebs cycle and cytochrome system, similar to humans and um, a lot of other um, vertebrates. And so they're quite similar in that respect, but many of them can uh, metabolize without oxygen present at all. So there is an aerobic cycle and an anaerobic cycle. Their nervous system, you can see highlighted here in the green, you see two nerve cords running the length of the body, the dorsal and ventral. And then as you expect, we have an anterior clump of neurons and a posterior clump of neurons. What would this neurons, what would these neurons be correlated to? And why would they have a clump in the middle of their bodies? Well, this relates to their reproductive system. So as I said, you have, they have a different genital pore here around this area than they do their anus. In most organisms, those two are gonna be collected together. So instead of having two concentrations of um, ganglia, they have three.
Nematodes are dioecious. The males are going to seek out the females. The males are generally a lot small, smaller than the females, and fertilization is going to happen internally. And here is another interesting adaptation to the pseudosalomic pressure on the in, inside of a nematode, because to get the sperm into the female, the male has to use these things called copulatory spicules. And copulatory spicules are these long, chitinous barbs that they use to actually physically hold the female open. And while they're holding them open, then they press tightly. You have a, a sperm guiding apparatus that transfers the sperm into the female. And then the second interesting feature of this is that the sperm are not motile. They don't have flagella and they don't have an acrosome for generating energy, um, which is highly unusual. Instead, the sperm are amoeboid. And this may be an adaptation so that they can crawl with pseudopods through the high internal pressure of the inside of a female nematode. Given our limited time here, this is really all we know about the biology of these nematodes. Uh, the most important aspect of their biology is their parasitism of the crew, sometimes in gruesome ways with horrendous results. So the most important part is for you to know the species, um, and so tomorrow I'll send the tr transmission uh, discussing the species that you're required to know in the transmission.